pleasure this evening of chairing this little discussion with the filmmakers for the extraordinary film that you just saw. I mean, was this the best film ever to see in Aspen? I mean, it's just, it was just fantastic. Um, uh, I'd like to introduce our filmmakers. Uh, to my left, Julie Bergman Sender is a producer and director and co-owner, there's the sound, of Balcony Films, a media and production company. Um, she formerly produced films with Sidney Pollack, partnered with Jodie Foster in the formation of Egg Pictures, and she was the producer of Harmony. Uh, next to her is Stuart Sender, the director, writer, and producer of the film whose work has been a nominated for two Academy Awards and a Directors Guild Award. And next to him is Jay Harmon, president and CEO of PAC Scientific, who has taken a hands-on approach to his fascination with the patterns that are found in nature and used his fascination with biomimicry to design more efficient and sustainable industrial equipment. Um, I should mention that Harmony was shown at the first uh, Sundance uh, festival in London last year and evidently led to, uh, from what I understand, quite a bromance between Prince Charles and Robert Redford. I can certainly understand that. We'll maybe talk about that. Also won a uh, top prize for artistry and film at the 2013 Environmental Film Festival in Washington, D.C., and you can imagine why. There's so much to discuss. We don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to just throw out a, a couple questions for our panel and then leave it open to you for a few more before we have to wrap it up. So could I just um, ask Stuart, what came first, the idea for the film or the prints? Well, the prints really came first. I mean, it, was, it really was his idea for the film. As he says at the beginning of the film, he made a movie about global warming in 1990. Right. And that's where that kind of lovely clip of, of him and Al Gore comes from. And he made this first film when we were kind of learning about what the human impact was of our rather, rather large footprint on the planet. Mm -hmm. And 20 years later, he said, well, this is still happening, but now we know we're doing it, and maybe it's time to ask why. And, but how did the two of you manage to get together on this? Jules, you wanna? Jules? Um, well, you know, as most often happens with these things, it was a complete accident. Um, a, a colleague of there ours- There are no accidents. Okay, it was by design. Um, <laughs> it was the grand harmony of nature. Yes, exactly. There was a colleague of ours who had met the prince at a conference, a food conference, and the prince mentioned to him that he was interested in making a film and that he'd written a sort of outline of what he wanted to say in the film. And did this colleague, um, did he know any filmmakers? And I promise you that he said yes, because he didn't want to say no to His Royal Highness, and we were probably the only filmmakers that this guy knew. <laughs> so, so that you know, said, um, we then had the opportunity to go to London and meet with His Royal Highness among the minions of people that you have to move your way through before you get to him, and, um, and then we all decided to, to collaborate together. The truth is they asked us to write up some ideas about the movie, and the spell check at one point put, kept, kept putting an H in Wales, and <laughs> and and we missed one. Oh no! And it went it went it almost killed the whole project. You know? <laughs> so so was it so was it tough getting through the handlers? Well, what really happened was we got to know some people for a few days. We were told there was going to be a big meeting with a lot of people, and we were going to get to meet Prince Charles. And what ended up happening was there were, there were four or five of us around a table. We were briefed about protocol and what to say and how to curtsy, which you did very beautifully, I have Would to say. Would you like to demonstrate? Would you and, like me to? Uh, absolutely. Okay. So this is and the- Careful, you're, you're, you're wired. I'm wired, so I can't really do it the way I did it because my chair's in the way, but it was something like this. She went a, she went a little deeper and all the, like, the secretaries and everybody kind of tittered, you know? It was like, oh, look what we got the Americans to do. Um, and the prince came into the room you know, with his hand outstretched, and we got into a really deep conversation right away. And we were really blown out that this was this man who we'd heard so much about, but who spoke in this incredibly passionate and articulate way about all this stuff from 
technology to architecture to agriculture to corporate social responsibility and 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 while his communications director who became really one of the biggest boosters and fans of this at the beginning was kind of against it and and the prince said you know this is this is my work this is why i'm here is to do this and if there's some risk involved so be it cuz he gets a little um, a hard time occasionally from the British press. And, but people have really received this and, you know, and, and, and even from the beginning it was, we're gonna make this movie, but we weren't gonna be making a movie about the prince, we we're gonna be making a movie about the principles. Wow. And he really stands by them and hopefully we did him uh, justice. Did he wanna know about your own environmental creds as well as your filmmaking creds? I mean, did you have it? Did you bring anything to the table as far as your own interest in this particular topic? Yeah, well, I think we did. We we kind of live in this world. We had just made a film called The Garden that we produced, which is about the largest urban garden in America in South Central LA, that became the focus of a political and real estate dispute that that had just been nominated for an Academy Award for Best Documentary that we made with a filmmaker named Scott Kennedy in Los Angeles. So that had happened and. You know, I'm, I'm sure, you know, we all kind of checked each other out and made sure that we understood each other. But he really pushed us, he really pushed me. I felt really pushed. In a lot of ways, it's how, it's how I came to Jay. Because the prince really wanted to talk about this kind of patterning in nature and these larger issues about how the kind of geometry and patterns in nature are so central and it led to a discussion that led us to Jay Harmon, who's actually realizing this stuff in a practical way and making an, a, you know, a real meaningful difference in the world. So Jay, did you know the Prince before this? Uh, well, as an Australian, you know, Australia is part of the Commonwealth and it's uh, fairly close to royalty in that sense, you know, the culture, so, but not personally. Right? But, but do, do you, had you had occasion to demonstrate your work to anybody I had written to him a number of times over the last 20 years um, and got some very nice little uh, responses from his secretary, I'm sure, mm -hmm. but uh, no, no real demonstration. It was actually through uh, Julie and, uh, yeah, so this was, you know, this was my connection. And, and tell me a little bit about what your business now is, is doing. You're, you're using these wonderful, you know, uh, shapes, spirals, things like that. Um, well, yeah, if you think about it, um, every living thing goes through a liquid phase in its development. And when it does that, as it's growing, it takes on the geometry of water movement. And water always moves in spirals. Even when we see water going down a straight pipe, slowly down a straight pipe or down a, uh, a stream, that water is rotating. And there's a common shape to all of that movement throughout the biological world. So of the somewhere between 2 million and 100 million species that exist on Earth today, every one of those organisms and every part of every one of those organisms is built to the geometry of these spirals. And uh, over about 20 years, I was able to reverse engineer what that classic pattern was. And once I had that, I was able to get a collective of um, engineers and uh, scientists together, and we started to look at the different things in the industrial world that use energy, um, that uh, are trying to minimize friction, and that are trying to be more efficient. And uh, we were able to start adapting these spiral shapes into everything from fans to pumps and refrigeration systems and aircraft design. And, and, uh, just, it's kind of endless. Pretty much everything that humans do involves moving something through fluids or fluids through something or heat. I was, I was terribly interested in the tornado cliff. Is there anything useful we can do with those since we seem to be having more of them? Well, we absolutely think so. I think there's a way of mitigating tornadoes before they actually occur. And, uh, and that's something that we've just com completed a scientific white paper on. And uh, it's just being presented to the 
to the government, to government agencies in the next couple of weeks. U.S. or in Australia? In, in the U.S. Well, they need all the help they can mm -hmm. get. Better that than FEMA coming in after the fact, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I wanted to ask you, uh, you, you reference, and the Prince references in the film, that sort of public perception, that he's kind of like a I mean, we've thought of him for years as kind of a goofy guy who talks to plants and, you know, has kind of a radical approach to, or, you know, a, a radically a, a offense, you know, has, takes offense at, at modern architecture. And, and so, you know, he has the, you wonder sort of what to make of him. Um, he seems to be aware of that. But, you know, after this film, it was like, okay, you know, we thought he was goofy, but in actual fact, he was prescient and wise. Um, how much of that did, came through in, in your talking to him that, you know, he, uh, he was aware of that perception? You want to take that? Well, he, you know, as you said, he's very aware of the perception and um, <clears throat> we all know people who live in bubbles and I would, I would venture to say that his bubble is probably as, as big and as tight as any bubble I've ever seen. And so I think, you know, part of what came with him, I mean, I don't know this from anything he said to me, but I do think that he, he grew into himself and he got to a point in his life where he, 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 he didn't want to feel hindered any longer by whatever perception. And of course, often when you do that, the real you comes out and, and you're much more accessible and you're much more authentic. And, um, we were shooting with him on his farm in, in the countryside with a crew from Manchester who, you know, one could argue were not necessarily, you know, royals or anything. Um, and on the second day of shooting, we all took them to dinner and they said, we've never seen this guy. This guy's great. Like, we've, we've, we've been watching him on the news and we've been seeing him interviewed on the BBC and Never seen the they had never way. seen this this person, and I think that's when Stuart and I kind of looked at each other and thought, well, we we might be onto something here in terms of helping reveal this other persona who who's who really is not the persona at all. It's the person. Right. Did he give you feedback much on the film as it was progressing? Oh yeah. He gave us a lot of feedback. He gave you notes. Oh, yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, very, you got, very good notes. If you actually. got notes, you know, handwritten notes, they, they came from him. And he's famous for writing these kind of long faxes, you know, long memos, handwritten memos, and we'd get them faxed to us. And they were really detailed and they were always really smart. And, you know, I, I think we thought, or at least I did when we started to work, we were making a kind of environmental movie. Right. But it's really a kind of a bigger thing. It is. And, this sort of way of looking at the world and the, the issue about it's really something about, you know, Janine Benya says it very beautiful, this is about a change of heart. It's, it's and, very spiritual. And he is very spiritual. Right. And that push, but also, but in a, in a really interesting kind of way, right, because it's connected to really changing things in the world. It's like, I want to think about how I'm going to build a city. I'm right. going to think about how we should grow our food. I'm going to think about the rainforest. I'm going to think about indigenous people. I'm going to think about technology and business and try and hold all this stuff at one time. That's a pretty kind of deep way of thinking. And, you know, that was always something that, you know, was coming back. Like, I'm not sure we got that yet. And we were, we were really always um, grateful for the challenge. And he put us to work sometimes. I can imagine. I mean, you know, the way that it sort of all connects, and he even references, you know, that in the public eye, he's kind of flitting from, you know, organic farming to architecture to this to that. And it, you know, you get that, if, if you're just looking at sort of the news stories every six months or something, you have this sense of this kind of dilettante. But in actual fact, he's thinking of it very holistically, which was was really a remarkable kind of revelation and, and terrific. I do want to throw it out to the audience here, in the back there. Thank you for the film. It's very powerful and feel honored to, uh, to uh, have viewed it as the rest of the audience here in Aspen. My question is, what would it take to get this film into every high school in the United States, Europe, Asia, and uh, I mean, this, this 
process should be started, and it's wonderful at our age because we can do something about it, but it's not necessarily inborn with us, but at that age, it would be inborn to be, you know, instilled in their DNA, if you will. We're, we're working on it. Um, we have, this film's life has been kind of an interesting trajectory. It actually appeared first as a television special on NBC. It was kind of a television hour, and then Brian Williams from NBC did an interview with Prince Charles. And, but we all felt like we were a little shortchanged about the movie, and we made this longer film, which I refer to as The Prince's Cut. And, um, and we're working on it. We have a couple of distributors who are interested. We're way open to people's help um, and, you know, and, and open to ideas. And we, we have some. And uh, you know, we're, we're going to make a lot of efforts to do that. You, you uh, flash by it in the film about about the HVAC, about the air conditioning, and it's in so many ways, you know, we, we spend so much time talking about the transportation sector, and it's an absolutely huge thing that if there really are those kind of cost savings, I'd be curious if you can detail for us a little bit more about, I mean, that should seem to be an easy thing. I mean, if Dyson can figure out how to get people to change their vacuum cleaners by changing the design, if changing the design of air conditioners saves that kind of money and, and change that kind of, uh, it, that, that should be an easy fix. Could you describe in a little bit more detail what, what's holding that back, what the design change is and what's holding back the uh, adaptation? Well, yes, you'd think it would be easy. I mean, to any thinking person, it's a kind of a no-brainer. Um, but there is incredible inertia in the built world companies tend to stay with what they know rather than moving in a radical direction because this is radically different. And we took this to the biggest manufacturers of air conditioning and refrigeration in the world and, and the immediate response was it was nonsense. So we spent probably the last 15 years, I invented it 15 years ago, we spent the last 15 years really trying to find the resources and the backing to do the scientific work. And we've probably invested in the order of $20 million in developing it, and we've got to the stage now where it's absolute, the science is absolutely proven. We've now built it, um, and we're negotiating with multinationals for the first phase, which is in cooling um, high temperature switching in, um, in the grids. So uh, it's a very large industry. It's got a lot of needs. It's kind of low-hanging fruit, fruit for us. It's, it's a fairly easy one for us to get into. Um, and the other one that we're doing, we have some business happening now with, uh, in the aerospace industry. And I'm not allowed to tell you anything about that because it's all under wraps. But um, it's actually cooling. The best I can tell you is cooling hypersonic vehicles. So, um, well. One thing is it uses water, and water is an extremely efficient way of, uh, of you know, if you use that in the refrigeration cycle, it is more efficient if you can manage to make it work than refrigerant gases. And of course, the benefit there is you're not, you don't have the problems of refrigerant gases and the cost of those gases. So the capital cost of the equipment comes down dramatically. This doesn't have a compressor in it, for instance. There's a large saving, but it is, inside out thinking and it takes um, people in those industries to take the time to rethink. And now we've got full endorsement from um, really quite outstanding academics in the US that, that have investigated this and, and it's, it's demonstrated. It's, um... Questions? Yes, here. I was wondering, um, who is responsible for the research for the film, in particular the wonderful farmer from Louisiana, Mr. Oh, he Uncle? He was great. <laughs> um, well, do you want me to answer that or do you want to answer that? Oh. Um, well, I mean, that, in a way, it's the process of making a film like this, where um, you sort of know what the assignment is. And I say sort of only because I spent so much time in my career making feature films, narrative feature films, where everything is planned out ahead of time. 
and you have a script, and then it's about running a small city of people. And um, when you make documentaries, you have a plan and you have a thesis, but you also have to leave yourself open both in the planning and in the shooting for those moments that are complete surprise and may even change the trajectory of the story you're telling. So in the research, um, we sort of knew that we wanted to balance home farm and that fancy, tony, beautiful farm that's the prince's farm with something that felt more accessible and that was not based on being frankly, a wealthy person with a farm, but an actual, you know, real farmer. Um, so we cast, no, I'm just kidding. Um, so, so we, you know, we, we had a really good research team, but ultimately, you know, Stuart and I are a real mom and pop shop in that sense, and we do the research ourselves, and then you just get incredibly lucky, and you find people like this. But the internet, you know, is a really great tool, as we all know, and you can order Cajun grain if you want online. You know, Kurt Uncle sells his 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 rice, so he was findable. And well, we knew we, we knew we needed him. We I, I, we, I, we wanted him. We didn't know it was him, and then we found him. And I think maybe even the New York Times had written a piece about Kurt. You know, and we called him, and he was like, "Sure, come on down. My my son will make you." some jambalaya, which was great. His son makes a mean jambalaya. And he cooked us some rice, too. I thought, you know, one of the best lines in the film was where he said, you know, if you didn't know better, you'd think the prince and I went to school together. Well, we didn't. <laughs> it, was, it was just genius. You know, I'm surprised he didn't go to Gordonston and take cold shop. Um, more questions? Yes, here. The film was really um, uh, a joy to see the, the important issues that it's easy to buy into. I'm curious about the prince. When, when you look at Charles in front of the castle and the signet ring and the curtsying and all of that, one can't help but think this is patronage, um, a bit of an affectation. And so my question is where the truth in that is. Uh, he, he's an important figure and he has an important set of causes. How needle moving has he been? Um, in your research of him or in your awareness of him in terms of um, capital flows, bringing legislation. You mentioned a meeting that he convened. In other words, I could not tell from the film whether this was a piece of, a, of an affected anachronism uh, moving a very important cause or um, this was a film about a very important man doing good work. It, I couldn't tell and maybe you can put some metrics on it. For example, how large are his foundations? How much money does he raise? Um, put some meat on the bone on that, if you would. Well, I, I really would like to speak to that. It's a really important question. It's a good question. Um, you know, he has a very, as he said in this interview he did with Brian Williams, he has a really funny job, because his, his sort of his job is really waiting for his mother to die, right? And so what is he going to do in the meantime? And part of it for us was researching this and trying to figure out, it wasn't just like, did he want us to make his film, but did we want to do this? And the first thing we did is we went back and read all of his speeches. So he, his first public speech when he was 21 was about the environment and the despoiling of the, of the British countryside. So this isn't like, he's been, you know, for real on these issues. He really was involved in dealing with the ozone layer. He was the, one of the first people who was like really a convener around that. You can go to Marin County and talk to Alice Waters and people who are pioneers in the organic food industry. He's their hero in the slow food movement around the world because he's really made a difference in moving that dial. You know, he's had a, a foundation for corporate social responsibility for going on 30 years and has trained executives from Fortune 500 companies, this thing that happens at Cambridge, you know, they brought together the eight largest pension funds in the world and talked about it. You can look at the work he's done with kind of micro loans to, you know, a thousand pounds to a guy who started a copy shop in Manchester and now he's got, you know, shops all over Britain. And I don't have to say, you know what I mean? Like, 
we, we bought in, I mean, we joke, right? Like the, the tagline to the movie could be, because sometimes everybody just needs a good king. So, you know, we've gotten to work with some great people and he's really up there. And I think the answer is, um, you know, he's, he's the only foreign leader who's been given by the indigenous people in Brazil, you know, this kind of medal about being, you know, hero of the Amazon. You know, his, that thing and that meeting led to the red agreement. You know, we're talking about some billions of dollars. So in the confines of not being an elected official, who's not supposed to meddle in um, policy and lawmaking, which probably a lot of people would feel he crossed, he's crossed the line more than once. Um, and I'm not sure how I'd feel about that. You know, we're supposed to be, you know, d Democrats at least with a small d. But I, I give you a sort of passionate answer because my observation of it is he's really made a big difference in the lives of a lot of people. And, and I would just add one quick piece to that, which is to say that this is not um, a person who's running for office. This is not a person who needs a job. And this is not a person who um, has to prove himself in order to get to the next place in his life. And so it puts him in a very unique place. And his choice is to not be terribly um, out there about what he's done. Like we could spend five hours telling you what he's done around the world. Um, but it's not really what he, it doesn't matter to him that much, you know? And it's, to me, I found that to be very moving, that we were with someone who had accomplished so much and who didn't really feel like he needed to tell anybody. Nobody knew before they saw this movie the incredible amount of work that he was doing in, in the Lower Ninth Ward in New Orleans. Yeah, Nobody true. knows that. Yeah, they're not, he's not advertised. He doesn't advertise. Brad and Pitt. so right. there's something, you know, in a way it's like asking you to have a little bit of a paradigm shift of the way you think about the way people advertise their good works. And I'm not saying people shouldn't advertise their good works. I'm not really making a value judgment on that. But I do believe that it's very interesting and refreshing when someone doesn't. And he just doesn't. He doesn't need to. And I can add that, uh, I mean, until the last couple of years, who has heard of biomimicry? Our experience is almost no one. And when we went to corporations, when we went to academic institutions, trying to postulate that nature can actually teach us how to be better engineers and scientists and physicists was completely dismissed. And we struggled and struggled and struggled to get credibility for the subject. Even though we have hundreds, probably thousands now, of prototypes across a whole range of industries that clearly demonstrate what biomimicry can do. And there are at least a couple of thousand different operations in the world doing biomimicry. Since this film, suddenly biomimicry has started to come into the vernacular. And there are articles printed on it weekly now. And we go to corporations and we're finding that people are saying, oh, that's interesting, tell me more. So he's been really, from my point of view, absolutely pivotal. So. We're allowed to have one more question. Mm -hmm. um, yes. You mentioned something about looking for distributed on whatever you can many film festivals or you're meeting with people by distribution. <coughs> yes. It seems like such a Yes, we've been we we um, as Linda said, we, we, we won this award at this festival, this environmental festival in Washington, D.C. Um, and now we're starting to entertain other festivals um, around the country and, and around the world. We're starting to get people, you know, now it's going to get translated into Turkish, Hebrew, Spanish. Spanish. Um, so we're getting invitations from these countries and they're saying, would you bring the film and we'd like to translate it into... into you know, our home languages so we can show the film. And did, was the prince happy with the film? Yeah. I think he was. Yeah. I mean, honestly, he wouldn't have shown up in London if he, if, you know. That's true. And that, and that was also part of why we wanted to premiere the film in London. Um, aside from the fact that I, I really loved the idea of, of being in, in business with Sundance on this film because Redford's so um, committed environmentally as well. But um, secretly, I thought, you know, all the flack that he gets from the British press, it would be very difficult for them to see him standing next to Robert Redford and write about anything else. 
So in a way, it was my like sort of media mind thinking, you know, how do I try to art smart the British press, you know? Um, so yeah, he was very happy and, and he was very moved that Redford um, had watched the film and wanted to make it sort of his event at the first Sundance Festival in London. I'm afraid that's... Oh, just add one more thing. Yes. If uh, this book just came out two days ago and it talks a lot about these subjects sustainability, biomimicry, and the work that Prince Charles is supporting. So the shark's paintbrush, it's actually in the bookshop. Excellent. Yeah, and we'd ask you to go too to theharmonymovie.com. There's a Facebook page, sign up, let us know how to find you. We'd love to stay in touch as we move forward with the movie. Terrific, thank you so much. It's been really great, thank you. Thank you, Oscar. <laughs>